Okay. I take my inspiration from Thomas Huxley, who was well known as the, the most outspoken defender of the theory of evolution. Um, and one of his, um, uh, uh, well, his quotes that I, I find very important is that he said, skepticism is the highest of duties, and this, this is with respect to science. Skepticism is the highest of duties. Blind faith is the one unpardonable sin. And I think one of the problems in fisheries management and the oceans is that uh, a very large portion of the advocacy community advoca advocating for various things is really operating on blind faith. Uh, and they are not at all skeptical of some of the, uh, of the ideas that they're advocating. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through a range of topics. I'm going to just I just want to mention what is called the 30 by 30 movement. I don't know if that's uh, uh, is, if, is well known uh, at LSU, but it's uh, the, it's it's to establish 30 percent of the world's land and water in uh, protected areas by 2030, uh, and it has gained enormous traction. Uh, in the NGO community uh, and with various heads of state, including the Biden uh, administration. There is a bill before Congress right now to mandate setting 30% of the oceans in, uh, in protected areas. Um, uh, other heads of state, the Prime Minister of Canada, the Prime Minister, uh, uh, there's uh, perhaps 20 or 30 heads of state that are supporting this. Um, so it's a very important topic at the moment. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I want to go through a little bit of the history. The whole idea of protected areas or MPAs is coming from terrestrial analogs. Uh, and I'm going to really argue that the analogy is very, very poor. Um, then uh, I'll talk about what the claims that are being made for the benefits of MPAs, uh, what we know from theory, what the em empirical data say, and then I'll finally close by talking about the threats to the ocean and how I see us best uh, alleviating those threats. Um, so uh, again, as I just said, protected areas really have, have developed on the land. Uh, the establishment of the national parks uh, in the US is the example, but there were protected areas uh, really in the 19th century uh, actions in a number of countries to start setting aside parks. Now, uh, you get into the whole issue of, well, how protected is protected? Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, when U.S. national parks were set up, fishing was allowed, uh, often even hunting was allowed. Um, that, that's changed to some extent. Um, so I'm primarily work in fisheries, although my uh, training, it was as a terrestrial ecologist, and I actually did my, um, my PhD. Uh, on rodents. And uh, I have been managed to keep my finger in the terrestrial pie a bit. Uh, and uh, although it's, uh, I haven't been able to go there in a while, uh, I've been really fortunate to be able to do a fair amount of work in Serengeti National Park, including spending my first University of Washington sabbatical in 1993 and 94 in uh, working in the park. Um, and, uh, and I'm a big advocate of parks, uh, that uh, this is an air, uh, a Google Earth image um, of the, the, the diagonal line across going from upper left to lower right is the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania with Tanzania on the south. And what I, I put in that green boundary, that green line is the park boundary. And I hope even from this level, you can see that there's a, a difference um, uh, it's much greener in the park than it is outside the park. But we're going to do some exploration. Uh, and to the west of the park is uh, subsistence farming, very small scale uh, farming. Inside the park is uh, there's there's uh, no farming, uh, and it's it's a it's a reasonably well enforced park. Although there is a fair amount. Uh, of, of poaching that goes on. Uh, so it's certainly not, wouldn't qualify as well protected, but it's, it, it's pretty close to it. 
Uh, so here's a close up, uh, more close up. And this is the Mara River. That's the famous river where all, you'll see all the, the nature shows showing wildebeest crossing the river and being uh, go uh, gobbled up by crocodiles. And you see there's farmland on the outside of the park. In this, at this point, the Mara River is the park boundary, and you have natural undisturbed habitat inside the park. So this picture is my friend and longtime colleague, Tony Sinclair, who uh, was born in Africa, uh, grew up in Tanzania, uh, did his PhD at Oxford, uh, work is on the bu African buffalo, um, and has uh, really been uh, the lead scientist on uh, the Serengeti research uh, since the 1970s. Uh, he was the editor of all three major books on the Serengeti. And one of his projects has been to measure uh, the biodiversity in various dimensions inside and outside the park. So what his team has been doing is doing various kinds of sampling, transects for birds, sweep nets for insects, uh, trapping for rodents, uh, uh, various kinds of vegetative counts, and comparing what you see outside the park to what you see inside the park. So uh, just start with herbs, herbs and grasses. They are 90% less abundant outside the park. Trees are 80% less abundant. Ungulates are 99% uh, uh, less abundant. You see that almost everything is gone outside the park except for rodents. And rodents uh, are about twice as abundant outside the park as they are inside the park. But everything else, uh, you know, insects are 80% down and everything else is down more. Uh, that effectively the park is a refuge for biodiversity. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and part of that is just what you might call the reverse of a trophic cascade, that outside the park, if you go into agricultural land, you plow up the herbs and grasses, you chop down the trees, and you plant a totally different ecosystem. And that doesn't support most of the traditional biodiversity. And that is essentially the key reason that we need uh, parks in terrestrial ecosystems because out, because human use outside uh, of parks is highly transformative, particularly agriculture and grazing. So in the extreme, you take the tropical rainforest and you chop it down and either grow soybeans or graze cattle and all of the, 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 the plant ecosystem, the, the primary producers are gone, and you have uh, you have either uh, you have a new exotic primary production outside. And the fact is that most of the world has that is uh, amenable. Most of it that is either not northern rain, northern uh, forest, or uh, um, has been converted either to, to uh, cropland. So this is a map of crop uh, activities. Um, and uh, the rest is largely devoted to grazing, as I said, with the exception of the northern forest, which, which is just too cold for grazing or, or for, um, for crops. So this, uh, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is uh, some interesting pictures that have been done. Uh, where they have this little cubic meter frame. This green frame is one cubic meter. And what they do is they take this frame to different places and then inventory what they find in one cubic meter, in this case of a Costa Rican rainforest. And here are 100 species of plants, insects, birds. Um, I think that's pretty well what we see in that, in that, in, in that picture. There's don't see any mammals there. Uh, uh, now, in contrast, if you go to a cornfield, that's what you find in a cubic meter of a cornfield, mostly corn, <laughs> uh, a few agricultural pests, that's about it. So I, I'm just trying to make the point that food production on land is totally transformative of the native ecosystem. Oceans are very different. 
on land, agriculture and urbanization are totally transformative. The ecosystems are gone. Uh, in the oceans, the extent of change is much less. And a lot of this is because in general, we do not exploit the first and second trophic levels. Uh, there, I mean, there are some harvesting of marine plants. There's a little bit of harvesting of, uh, of krill, but in general, uh, the first and second trophic levels of marine ecosystems are largely un unharvested. And that would be the equivalent on land of not doing anything to the grasses, to the trees, to the wildebeest, to the ungulates and all the grazers. So that's the, the, the difference is enormous. This is an analysis that is done by Beth Fulton, who I, I think many of you may know. She's probably the premier marine ecosystem uh, modeler. Uh, tro uh, by, by, uh, trophic modeler. And what she did is she took 26 different marine ecosystem models and ran the models with and without fishing. And this is just presenting the density of the different trophic levels. And what you see is that, uh, that trophic level one is largely untouched. Trophic level two actually in these models is a little bit more abundant than it would be in the uh, absence of fishing. Trophic level three, basically no change. Uh, so, so trophic level one is primarily uh, zooplankton. I mean, phy uh, phytoplankton. Trophic level two is primarily zooplankton. Trophic level three is what we would typically call forage fish. Uh, Menhaden and things like that, but many, many, many species. Uh, trophic level four is the piscivorous fish, and uh, which is is definitely reduced in these models by fishing. And trophic level five and six are really uh, the really high trophic levels. Uh, be, be mar marine birds, some marine mammals, etc. The key point is. These systems, from a trophic perspective, are hardly changed. Compared to land, the trophic structure is totally disruptive. So let me talk about uh, 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 some on, on, on uh, marine protected areas. These are, I would say, two of the most famous marine protected areas in the world. And uh, the first two that I ever, I ever visited, uh, Hanama Bay in Hawaii is just a little bit east of Honolulu. I think it gets something like a million visitors a year. Uh, the Lee Marine Reserve in New Zealand is uh, an hour and a half drive north of Auckland. Uh, uh, both of these are incredibly valuable tourist locations. Uh, they're, they're, you know, there's no question that there's enormous value in this kind of, uh, of marine reserve. I'll point out that both of them are incredibly tiny. I think Hanama Bay is about one square kilometer <clears throat> and the Lee Reserve uh, maybe seven or eight square kilometers. They're little tiny things, but they generate staggering amounts of tourism. Um, now, let me talk about some terrestrial protected areas. And these are my, my two favorites. They're places that I've spent a lot of time. This is Serengeti National Park I was just talking about. And on the right is a picture of part of the Wood Chick Chick State Park in Alaska, where I've been doing field work since 1995. And my, my little study area is dead center in the middle. I don't know if you can see my cursor in the middle of this, um, of this, this picture. And it's been my true privilege to, uh, to spend uh, several weeks each year uh, tagging fish, taking genetic samples from them on these lakes. Um, and they are both incredibly popular tourist locations, uh, generating uh, millions of dollars of revenue uh, for tourists. Um, and I, as I say, I'm not, I'm not denigrating protected. I'm a big fan of protected areas. But what I want to point out is that neither of those places would qualify as a fully protected area. Uh, Serengeti National Park, uh, my, my job when I was on sabbatical there was to estimate the amount of uh, illegal poaching and, um, uh, and uh, potentially what the potential 
uh, sustainable yield of wildebeest was. And there's about 70,000, at least the last time I, I was uh, working on this, about 70,000 wildebeest a year harvested illegally in Serengeti National Park and a lot of other animals. Uh, nevertheless, it, it is uh, a very, very valuable tourist location. Wood Tikchik State Parks is the home to the largest and most valuable salmon runs in the world. Uh, and literally two thirds or 80 or more of the salmon returning to uh, the rivers in the Wood Chick Chick State Park and, the, and, the, and that region are harvested. And yet it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it'd be very difficult to say how different that system would be if the salmon weren't harvested. Uh, there would probably be a few more bears. Uh, there would probably be a, uh, a little bit more resident fish. But not only is there fishing for salmon, is bears are legally hunted in the park. Uh, sport fishing is a major industry in the park. A lot of it is catch and release, but not all of it. Uh, so the point is that the bio, both of these areas are havens for biodiversity. Neither of them would qualify as fully protected. Uh, now, uh, one of the primary advocates for um, uh, marine protected areas has been Jane Lubchenco, professor at Oregon State University, former head of the National Marine Fisheries Service. And uh, this is a paper she wrote back in 2015 that basically equates ocean protection with no-take marine protected areas. That is basically arguing that if it's not a no-take area, you're not protecting the ocean. Now, um, and part of this is a series of claims uh, that she and many others have made about marine protected areas. The first is that there are significant ecological gains by implementing a marine protected area, including more species in greater numbers and greater size and larger size. They're bigger and there's more of them. Uh, that fully protected areas have ecological benefits up to an order of magnitude greater than partially protected areas. That's again one of the claims that they help recover depleted fisheries outside the reserve and they provide uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And what I want to do now is, uh, go, well, is go through what we really know about marine protected areas and uh, and putting on my my skeptics hat uh, the first flaw in these claims is they are based on what happens inside an MPA and do not look at the impact outside because remember MPAs do not reduce fishing effort they simply move it and what you typically find is that the total amount of fishing is exactly the same. It's just that now you've got some areas that are not fished and some that are fished. And the claims for the benefits of MPAs are benefits about inside the MPA with no analysis of what happened outside where you're now fishing harder. Uh, and even worse, almost all the analysis uses what happens outside as a control ignoring the fact that you're going to be fishing more there uh, and, uh, um, and therefore grossly overestimating uh, the, the benefit of what's happening inside the reserve. But most importantly, presumably the purpose of MPAs for many of the objectives is not to, is a regional effect. That is, do we have more fish overall because we have an MPA? Or is it simply having some areas with more fish, some with fewer fish? And, and is, that, is that a good thing? Uh, so I and many others have done a lot of theory, but mostly modeling uh, of what will happen, what the regional benefits to catch and abundance will be of MPAs. And, uh, and what we've basically shown is yes, MPAs will benefit the uh, catch and abundance under three major uh, conditions. First, the stocks must be seriously overfished. Okay? If they're not overfished, you cannot improve catch or abundance. Uh, well, you can't increase both catch and abundance by uh, closing areas to fishing. You can increase abundance if you close enough of the area, uh, but then you're going to be sacrificing catch. 
uh, that the size of the MPA has to be appropriate to the dispersal distances of the species. You can't increase the abundance uh, inside the reserve if the fish move in and out too much. And you can't increase the catch if the fish don't move out a little bit. Uh, so you have to coordinate the size of the MPAs to the movement of the fish. And of course, the MPAs have to be effectively enforced. So let's look at the empirical evidence. So I'm going to review a couple of the, what I'd call the standard papers. These are all using what happens inside the outside the reserve as the control on what would have happened inside. So this is probably the most uh, the large scale uh, meta analysis. <clears throat> Sarah Lester led uh, a group mostly at uh, Oregon State and UC Santa Barbara. Um, and showing that across a range of MPAs, uh, the abundance of the biomass inside the reserves was um, typically many times higher than outside reserves, uh, that the density of fish was higher, the average size was a bit bigger, and the species richness was a bit bigger. Um, that uh, this is a paper by Ben Halpern, again, looking across a range of MPA studies. Uh, really show, showing potentially um, some impact of larger reserves having more impact on density, biomass, organism size, and diversity. And uh, that in general, the, re the uh, results tended to, to happen rather quickly. So now I want to dive into the one uh, big reserve network I know a fair amount about. Uh, and was involved in the setup, and that is in Southern California. So this is a rather low resolution map. This is the coast of California over here. Uh, Los Angeles is right here. San Diego's down here. Santa Barbara's in the upper left-hand column. And this shows you in red and blue, uh, the set of marine reserves that were, were put in place as a result of uh, both federal and state, uh, state actions. And this is really a model of what the MPA advocacy movement would like to see. They would like to see all of the coastal regions of the world set up with a set of reserves like this. So this is a paper that uh, was, uh, was done by a number of the MPA uh, uh, implementers and advocates uh, looking at just the reserves in the Channel Islands. Those are the islands that were there off the coast. And these are a bunch of their sampling sites. Uh, and the reserves were set started in a, a range of years. And from their paper, this is the trend in the abundance, just in biomass, both inside and outside reserves of the targeted species. Okay, And what you see is, there is a general trend for the increase in abundance of targeted species inside the reserve, uh, rising from 0.2 tons per hectare up to almost 0.4 with a, a simple regression line, and a declining trend in targeted species outside the reserve, uh, going from, say, 2.5 to maybe 1.8 or something like that. And now, this is exactly what one would expect under most of your MPA models. You've moved effort from roughly 20% of the area, uh, although often the areas set in reserves tended to be the preferred fishing sites. Uh, they were moved outside, and the result is abundance went up inside and went down outside. So are there more fish because of these MPAs? Do the math. If the abundance has doubled inside the reserve, but decreased by a third outside the reserve, and 80% of the area is outside the reserve, there's actually no increase in abundance. There, in fact, may be a decline in total abundance. So is the purpose to set up these areas that have very high abundance, that make great study sites for the academics who've been proposing all of these, uh, and pushing the recreational and commercial fishermen outside where there's lower abundance. I mean, that's certainly what has been the net effect. Um, Dan Ovando, who did his PhD at UC Santa Barbara with uh, two of these MPA advocates, Steve Gaines and, 
and Chris Costello um, <clears throat> made an attempt to estimate what the net effect of the MPAs, this is in his PhD, it's a paper that's now been submitted, uh, on the abundance of fish, of, of targeted species in the, in the, um, uh, in, the Cal in the Southern California Marine Reserves. And the bottom line is that it looked like over the initial years, there was a, uh, some increase in the overall abundance, but uh, 10 to 15 years out, there's just no evidence for there being more fish than there were before. And in this case, he was using the abundance of non-targeted species as, as the, re the regional control. Um, so uh, both the Hamilton paper and the Ovando work really suggest that all of these MPAs have not really increased the abundance of the species. All they've done is made them more abundant inside, less abundant outside. Um, just a little bit more uh, on empirical evidence, uh, Josh Sinner and his rather extensive group of, of colleagues have done a lot of meta-analysis of, um, of reserves uh, in coral reef systems, uh, showing that uh, there's really two dominant effects on the uh, abundance of fish in coral reef systems. Uh, one and the dominant one is how far you are from people. <laughs> that is, uh, it, so uh, on, that's the x-axis. So that's the index of human presence. If it's zero, then you are, uh, there's no one, there's no one living uh, nearby. Um, and um, uh, and whereas if it's, uh, and this is going to know that's a logarithmic scale. So if you take well-protected MPAs, you have about a thousand, little over a thousand kilometers per hectare. Uh, and if you go to an area that is really uh, lots of people, it may be down to 500, okay? Um, whereas if the areas are unprotected, uh, and this is totally open. You're at you're about the same, about a thousand if there's no one around. But if you go out to um, uh, to places that have a lot of people, then um, you're you're you've 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 lost eighty or ninety percent. Uh, so both the abundance of people and the level of protection make a difference. Uh, this is some data from the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, basically showing that the, the impact of establishing the, the vertical line 2004 is when a whole bunch of areas were declared um, uh, no-take areas within the Great Barrier Reef. And what you saw is about a 40% decline in the catch. Um, and they were using areas outside the Great Barrier Reef for the, to show that there had been a very slight decline in catch, but much, much greater decline in catch inside the Great Barrier Reef, basically arguing that the establishment of marine reserves in the Great Barrier Reef certainly did not increase the catch of fish. It actually caused a pretty significant decline. And that was, a, again, about a 30% of the Great Barrier Reef has been set aside as a no-take area. Um, there's a, there's interesting, there's a growing um, body of counter evidence of many of the claims. And the interesting thing is it's coming to a great extent from people that I would have put five years ago in the MPA advocacy group, John Bruno in particular. And this is a paper where, you know, there's claims that, um, that uh, making areas, no-take areas, increase their resilience to climate change. And this is a paper they recently published really suggesting we really don't see any evidence of this. Um, why, why is it that marine protected areas don't improve reef resilience? Um, the Gary Russ is again a person I would have put in the uh, um, in the MPA advocacy camp. And, uh, and he's really uh, arguing that um, that a lot of this, it's uh, that the, uh, that fishing isn't really driving uh, reef fish trophic biomass nearly as much as people have been suggesting. So let's step back, sort of go to a thousand, uh, the three thousand, a thirty thousand foot view, and say, you know, what are the threats to the ocean? And here I'm listing what I think are the threats to 
the ocean, biodiversity of the ocean, the ability of the ocean to produce the goods and benefits that we want. And these goods and benefits include oxygen production, include carbon sequestration, they include food production, they include tourism. Uh, um, um, uh, there's a whole bunch of benefits that the uh, tr marine transport, oil, oil and gas. And I would say these are the threats to the ocean. Uh, to me, global warming and climate change is number one. Ocean acidification, uh, pollution, including plastics. Uh, many, the coastal ocean estuaries are very severely impacted by terrestrial runoff. You know that the, um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is, um, is, a, is a, a World Heritage Site and it's been given what we call a yellow card, being warned that you are not protecting the Great Barrier Reef. If you want to maintain your World Heritage status, you have to do more. And the reason is terrestrial runoff that, yeah, they've put in, they've made it a park and they've stopped fishing, but they've not been tending to all the issues of runoff from mining, harbor development. And that's the major threat to the Great Barrier Reef marine ecosystem. It's not fishing. Uh, exotic species. Um, a lot of the extinctions that have taken place around the world have been due to exotic species. And while, oh, I think there's only one truly marine species that has gone extinct in the last 50 or 80 years, uh, uh, I think, and uh, well, there may be two now. Uh, certainly the first one was, uh, was due to exotic species. Illegal fishing is certainly a threat to the oceans and legal fishing, but I would certainly rank legal fishing in terms of a threat to the oceans and its goods and services well below those other, those other threats. I just want to point out that MPAs offer no protection from global warming, from ocean acidification, from pollution, from terrestrial runoff, from exotic species, or from illegal fishing, because all marine protected areas do is regulate legal fishing. And yet MPAs are the centerpiece for ocean conservation by many environmental NGOs. They just have got their priorities totally wrong. Uh, so let's talk about what are the best tools to ameliorate um, the impacts of fishing? Because remember, I mean, for for all of that's fundamentally all marine protected areas have done or 95% have been to regulate fishing. Uh, so uh, there are certainly concerns about fishing for overfishing, for bycatch, impacts on sensitive habitats and trophic impacts. Overfishing, we know how to solve overfishing. We use fisheries management. This is a paper we, uh, a large group of us published last year, simply showing that uh, in, the, in, the, in the half of the world's fisheries that have been well managed, the average biomass was declining through, that's the orange line, declining through the 70s, flattened out at about on average the level that will produce maximum sustained yield and has been rebuilding since then. And what we argue is the reason is that fishing pressure was rising through the 70s to the 90s and has been declining. Um, in a paper that just came out last month, many of the same group, it was a NC's working group, if you're familiar with them, uh, uh, we really looked at, at what were the nuts and bolts of management actions that pr promoted sustainable fishing. And what we found is that uh, rebuilding plans, uh, formal rebuilding plans uh, and uh, associated action, uh, the fisheries management intensity, both on a stock basis and a national basis. Bottom line of our analysis was that fisheries management uh, has lots of elements and the more of those elements you implement, the more you're able to maintain and rebuild fish stocks. So if we wanna stop overfishing, we know how to do it. We do it by managing fisheries. Most countries are doing it by regulating uh, catch, but in many cases, quite successfully, it's being done by regulating fishing effort. Um, so bycatch. Now, uh, the, the proven way to reduce bycatch is to change how fishing takes place. There have been spectacular um, 
reductions in bycatch by gear modifications, such as turtle excluder devices, uh, uh, to uh, for trawl nets to keep turtles from being killed, tory lines for long lines uh, to keep marine birds away, sonic beepers to keep uh, marine mammals away from uh, from uh, uh, from gill nets. Um, in some cases, fishing methods such as the tuna back down procedure, which almost completely eliminated the bycatch of, uh, of uh, porpoises. Um, and then uh, some very sophisticated methods that we'll call adaptive closures or sometimes are being called uh, dynamic ocean management uh, to reduce bycatch. The, uh, many of the fishing fleets in Alaska have formed cooperatives to uh, to agree on how to reduce bycatch of non-target species uh, that often involve uh, legal arrangements where a consulting company is contracted to receive reports from the observers on board the boats every day about catch and bycatch. And those consulting companies are legally authorized to close areas um, because of high bycatch. And it's been, it's been quite successful. Uh, Sensitive habitats. There's no question that sensitive habitats um, can be affected by mobile bottom contact gear. Uh, this is a paper, uh, again, with a whole bunch of authors <laughs> of, uh, of a large working group that, uh, is, uh, that met over five years. And this was a paper just looking at the footprint. And, uh, and, and what we've, uh, what's been shown is that the way you protect sensitive uh, benthic habitats is by identifying where they are because most benthic habitats aren't sensitive. Most bottom contact gear is on mud and sand that is very insensitive to bottom crawling. Its corals and sponges are the big, uh, big concerns. And there's move on rules, coral bycatch quotas. We know again how to protect those, um, those habitats. Trophic impacts. Uh, it's a big topic, lots of concern about impacts of fishing on their predators. This is a paper that, again, another group of us published a few years ago, really uh, arguing that, uh, that if you actually just look, and we just looked at the abundance of the forage fish, we looked at the changes in abundance of the predators, and there's actually very little uh, evidence. Uh, we have another paper that is in press and under embargo right now, doing this on a global uh, scale and really showing that there's very um, that that it's it's actually more common and we don't actually understand this why uh, higher trophic higher abundance of um, of forage fish uh, has led to lower rates of increase of um, their predators, but there really isn't a good empirical basis for showing that the overall abundance of uh, forage fish in the ocean affects the abundance of their predators. Um, I want to going back to the uh, MPAs in particular. North Atlantic right whales is one of the most high-profile biodiversity issues right now in the um, in the U.S. And there are two basic problems. One is they are being entangled in fishing gear, primarily uh, lobster and and uh, and crab and shrimp pots and uh, ships ship strikes. If we had tried to solve the, the North and right, the Atlant North Atlantic right whale problem 20 years ago by MPAs, we would have put them in the wrong place because the reason that we're running into fishing gear entanglement and ship strikes is that right whales have changed their distribution with climate change. They've moved into areas where um, pots are uh, from areas where there weren't pots. Uh, and if we'd set up they uh, used the distribution 20 years ago to set up MPAs, they wouldn't be in the right place. Uh, and for, the, for because of climate change, we need dynamic ocean man management. We don't need fixed place management. Finally, I wanna just talk about a paper that I, along with a couple of students in a class, published just looking at the, uh, this, this year, looking at the relationship between the trade-off between revenue, which is on the x-axis of this graph, and an overall measure of biodiversity. And what we found is that there really are win-win situations where you can get something like 80% of your potential revenue and maintain most of the biodiversity. 
Um, oh, I, I need to say more. And what we found is the way you do that is by area and gear specific management. So if you've got sensitive habitats, you protect those to mobile bond, bottom contact gear. If you've got places of high uh, bird bycatch, you implement, uh, you close those to the to, to long lining. That you don't, and it, it, the interesting feature of this analysis was that until you get to trying to maintain your biodiversity near 100%, none of the solutions that offer the best trade-off were no, included no-take areas. Um, I'm going to skip that one. So, uh, so I want to just close with some final critiques of some of the MPA advocacy. First, that the ocean is different from the land most marine biodiversity will always be outside of protected areas because managed fishing is not transformative. Um, another terrestrial concept is this idea of networks that uh, people discovered in terrestrial ecosystems that all your biodiversity ended up being in the parks, you know, if it was all farms and, and that, you, that, that you, did, you needed a way to get gene flow between the different islands of biodiversity. In the ocean, that's not true. First, most marine organisms have, or many of them have highly dispersal life history stages. And the other is that the, the areas between protected areas are not deserts of cropland, that, that there's, they're, they are different, but they are not that different. Um, uh, and and um, on my uh, whoa whoops sorry uh, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, my other real critique of the MPA advocacy movement is 20 years ago they were um, proposing science-based design methods, and that's really what happened in California. Uh, that a, a very long and very extensive pro science-based process. I mean, I was critical of many aspects of it, but it was a science-based design. And what they discovered, the, the MPA advocates, that it cost too much. Uh, it was very expensive. It didn't always get them what they wanted, which was more and more areas and marine protected areas. And they have been much more successful by going directly to heads of states like protect, pr pr President Obama, pr President Bush, um, the, the, the presidents of many countries around the world or the pre premiers and saying, look, you would be an environmental hero if you declared these large areas no take areas. Uh, and they've been very successful and they've gotten many, many very large no take areas established. Now, one of the characteristics of those is no one was fishing there. Uh, and that's why the heads of state were happy to do it. So the MPA advocates are saying, oh, wonderful, we're getting these large closed areas. It's not having any impact on, MP on, on marine biodiversity because they're almost all in the open ocean where the fish are highly mobile, even a million square kilometer reserve doesn't do much for tunas or anything really. And uh, no one was really fishing there anyway. Uh, now I wanna say there is certainly a role for MPAs. Uh, and I would love to see MPAs implemented in many of the places of the world that have very poor fisheries management. The, marine, the, the <clears throat> Mediterranean Sea would be a great, uh, if you could put 50% of the Mediterranean Sea in marine protected areas, I'd think that would be a great idea. Uh, but they need to have clear, measurable objection, objectives. Unfortunately, the places where they would do the most good is not where they're being placed. They're being placed in places where there's no fishing. Um, uh, and 30 by 30 is certainly not an effective approach to, um, uh, <clears throat> to protect biodiversity because uh, it's likely going to happen. The U.S. already has 25% of its area in no-take reserves, almost all in areas that were not being fished, and we could set aside the entire Arctic Ocean and achieve 30%, and it just hasn't done anything, anything to protect biodiversity. We should attain aim to protect 100% of the oceans with effective fisheries management measures. Um, and I'd say that's, I, I would say, let's have 100% of the oceans effectively managed by 2030. So finally, uh, if you want to uh, dive deeper into this, this is a book that my wife and I done published by Oxford University Press, and I deal with almost all the issues uh, I talked about in this talk. And thank you very much and be happy to answer questions. 
All right, thank you very much. So there are a few questions already, and of course everyone can type the messages directly to me. Um, I'd like to start with a question from Eugene Turner. Um, he said, um, I'm just gonna read the, the question directly since I think that's a little easier. So he said, let's accept the two interpretations of the value of MPAs exist. Why isn't there more coherence between the science perspectives within conservation groups and professional scientists like yourself and others? And how, do, how should we move forward? Well, I think there are some promising signs. I'm involved in a, uh, a group being led by uh, Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy to look specifically at large ocean uh, MPAs uh, uh, and to do e exact, exactly that. Um, and uh, you know, because I, I think that the uh, that the many people in the in the NGO movement have seen that these large ocean MPAs really aren't being very uh, aren't really achieving anything. Um, but uh, it you know it is it is a deeply ingrained, deeply religious belief within many people in the advocacy community. You know, and uh, and they they they're you know frankly they're just like. Uh, the Trump supporters, you know, they, 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 it's all fake news. They talk to each other, they make themselves, they have a, they have a narrative and they simply are not interested in the scientific literature. Okay. So the next question that I'll take here is from Jill to pizza. Um, and the, the first question is, do you see different trends in fish biomass with the size of the MPA? Um, well, okay, I haven't size done that. MPA. I haven't done that analysis, but there was that one slide from a Ben Halpern paper. And the, I think the answer was a slight trend, but not, not I don't think it was statistically significant. Um, oh, okay. But again, you, I mean, size it, de it depends on the biology of the species you know uh, for uh, for small pelagic fishes or or, or, or or most pelagic fishes move so much that uh, it, it would take that there just haven't been MPAs big enough you know so all those California um, reserves when we were going through the science design, we just said, look, there's not going to be in any impact on any of the migratory species, whether it's squids, sardines, uh, tunas, you know, they, you, you would need reserves that are the size of California to affect those species. Um, whereas well, something that's really sedentary, like abalone, you'd have a very small reserve is, is very effective. So in you had two slides. I think they might have been back to back. One, one had um, you were talking about how there are a couple of these very small marine protected areas, and the next one um, was describing the disparity between um, the abundance of species within the marine protected area versus outside. And it was such a big discrepancy. I was really wondering if having a small marine protected area would uh, skew that kind of analysis. I was imagining like so many fish just packed into one little marine protected area. Do you have anything to say about just the statistical aspect of that? Um, well, the problem—I mean, the, the the problem in all these things is uh, what you know it, is is what's the what's the control? Um, uh, but uh, I mean, there, there's no—you know—the I, 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 first the one in Hawaii, Hanama Bay, was the first one I ever went to, and I at the time I was working uh, on tunas in in uh, New Caledonia, French territory in the South Pacific, you know, I had a coral reef in front of my office, literally a hundred yard swim out from, from our, the beach in front of our office. And there were coral reefs. And I spent a lot of time diving in New Caledonia. And I never saw big fish because uh, the, the people who live there are incredibly avid spear fishermen. And I went to Hanama Bay and I saw this giant fish, you know, in this little tiny reserve, one square kilometer. And, you know, those fish knew <laughs> that if they went outside, they were, I mean, the ones who went outside were no longer there. Um, so you can have big impacts in a very small reserve, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's no question that, uh, that, uh, that there'd be a lot of, you know, places that don't have any reserves, having uh, a lot of the, some of these little reserves could be a great uh, tourist attraction. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Um, I think this is in reference to your slides where you show relative biodiversity. Um, so it says, have you considered the impact of a shifting baseline in evaluating MPA performance? Um, well, I mean, that's, uh, it, it, it all gets into what's, what's the, uh, what's the control. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you, if you take a place that has been, uh, seriously overfished, you've got, you know, what you don't, you don't have a baseline. And even if you, uh, you know, take an area that's seriously overfished, you close a pretty good part of it. Uh, the chances are that fish are not inside, are not going to recover to the baseline. Again, unless it's really large, there's a lot of, of migratory fish that you're, you're not going to have any impact on. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to say what the baseline is unless you have an idea of, um, of you know, what's the, the level of, of fishing intensity. Um, and so in, when we were doing the, the design in, in California, um, you, you know, it was, it was very clear that the only species that were gonna benefit were those that would been fished fairly hard and uh, and it turned out there there weren't many of them. In fact, the 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 law that was passed in California was largely generated by concern about the decline of a number of rockfish species that ultimately were declared overfished by NOAA, put in rebuilding plans. Uh, and so there was this this litany of oh the oceans are dying, the, this ecosystem is collapsing, and we need marine protected areas. And they got a state law passed to establish these reserves, but only in state waters. And it turned out that none of those rockfish were abundant in state waters. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's, you know, the impacts are gonna be very species and location specific. So if we don't have um, quality historical values for the baseline, what do you think we should be using to try to evaluate in a standardized way? Well, I mean, the, you know, the regardless of what your baseline is, the first question is, are, are is the overall abundance of fish being increased because of the reserves? And, and, and not the abundance inside the reserve, but the overall abundance. And, and, uh, and you can do that without actually knowing what your, what your, what your, what your baseline is. Uh, if the overall abundance of fish isn't increasing, they're not, you know, they're not achieving the potential to increase abundance or to potentially increase catch, right? You've got to, you've, you've got to see the abundance going up. Now you can still have nice tourist areas, even if the total abundance isn't going up by having some areas that have high abundance. So you need to be very specific about what's the objective and, uh, and, uh, and can you measure that objective? So you can, if, if, you, if you can generate areas that have lots of fish, it doesn't really matter if it's not in a, you know, a pristine ecosystem. If you got lots of fish, lots of big fish, you're gonna get tourists. I also have a question personally. This isn't one that was sent in. Mm -hmm. So at one point you suggested that these marine protected areas that are kind of big and out where people are not fishing anyway are not effective but we've only done a hindcast analysis in terms of what you are presenting. What about the future impact of having staked off an area as safe for the future? Do you think that's useful for those kinds of things or is it just kind of a waste overall? Well, um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's, the, that's the, uh, the assumption as well. At least we've got this area protected. Okay, um, but uh, and, and well, if I, I you know I, I just I just I just think it's it's a, it's an incredible waste of our energy and effort to lock up areas where no one's fishing, uh, because a uh, those may be areas where uh, remember where I'm 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 again I'm I'm always thinking in terms of this trade-off between biodiversity and food production. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, and certainly the reason the, the fishing industry objects to locking up all of these areas is first as they see it as the thin edge or the wedge, because, you know, there's a large movement uh, to ban all fishing. Uh, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. But, uh, you know, there was a world end of fishing day with thousands of people on the streets, particularly in Europe. Um, so, but, um, you know, if we're concerned about biodiversity, let's devote our energies to things that are going to help biodiversity, rather than might help in 20 or 20 or 30 years. Um, okay, I, I see your point in that respect. Um, thank you. So we have a I think we have two more questions right now, but of course other people are welcome to chime in. So the first one is uh, how much of your data on fish stock is fisheries independent versus data from commercial or recreational fisheries? Well, now I think you're referring to the, the RAM legacy stock assessment database, um, which is, uh, um, is the one that I use to talk about the trends in abundance of managed fisheries. Um, almost all of that is based on fisheries independent data. Um, uh, well, not almost all of it. I mean, it depends a bit on on where um, the the exception would probably be um, the high seas tuna fisheries where you don't we don't have many surveys. Cer certainly for the US for Europe, um, South Africa, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Chile, Peru, uh, those countries do uh, scientific surveys. And most of their stock assessments are based on that. And, uh, um, and length sampling and size sampling, age sampling associated with that. High seas tunas are more problematic that there's uh, there, some of them uh, rely on tagging studies. Um, most of them, uh, well, and, and uh, usually tagging and most of a lot of those assessments are size based. So they're using changes in size distribution. But again, those are becoming from sampling size on commercial vessels. There's very little truly fisheries independent data on high seas tunas. Okay, thank you. This next one um, is from Dr. Delia, and he says MPAs have other conservation uses. Johannes was concerned about the live fish trade and the taking of large groupers, and he was also concerned about ronin and other fishing methods. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, one of the one of the things about um, uh, you know one of the potential benefits of MPAs is they may bring with them a level of enforcement of illegal activity. So, you know, you know, rope known and, and, and dynamite fishing are, are typically illegal everywhere, but quite commonly practiced. Um, and so if you can get truly effectively enforced MPAs that also effectively uh, prevent illegal fishing. Uh, that's a, that's 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 a, that's a that's a true benefit um, for sure. I mean, the problem is that getting effectively enforced MPAs in places where those practices are common is reasonably different. That dif difficult. Almost almost all the MPAs being set up globally are being set up in places like the U.S. and Australia, uh, and you know that have you know, that they're really not going to have much in the way of benefits and the places they're needed uh, are not where they're being put. And I just wish the MPA advocacy group would concentrate their energy on trying to improve both MPA distribution and fisheries management in the countries that really need it. Okay, thank you for that. And if there are any other questions, I think now's the time to to say it, otherwise we'll sign off. I'll just give like one more minute. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Dr. Hilborn. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there to meet with we, we meet with you all, but I'd be happy to follow up with anyone who wants to talk more about this. Yeah, certainly. If anyone would like to well, get in touch, Eugene just Turner email has, me. Oh, Eugene with a hand up, maybe. Has hand up. Sure. Let me, let me just uh, message uh, him and make sure. No, yeah, that was meant to say thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up here then. So okay. thanks everyone for coming and okay. uh, everyone have a good day. Hopefully we bye can bye. Do, do something uh, in, in the next semester after the vaccine's out. Yeah, it would be great. I'd love to be to get down there again. Sure. All right. Yep. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks. Take care.